So we heard a lot already, quite uh, in-depth things. Um, what I'm going to talk about with all these options you heard about, basically um, giving you like, a, um, like more like a very uh, like an overview of what what is really beneficial for many applications. So uh, because you have this plethora of things and configuration options, but actually most of them usually won't won't help you a lot. So I will basically tell you what helped for us, and for us means. Uh, from the uh, nurse exascale scientific application program point of view, so we uh, what this is, and, and uh, I will just uh, explain like in the next uh, the following, if my okay. So <coughs> yeah, it's the first slide. Okay, so so first again, the differences uh, between uh, uh, like for example Edison and, and what we have in Cori KNL. Um, so we have twice as many nodes now. Um, this is this is quite throughput wise. This is quite 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 good, but also note that like um, we have now much more cores per CPU and as well as much more hardware threads per CPU. So when you target a, a Cori KNL, you want to exploit that. If you don't, you basically uh, your code won't perform well, because the single core speed is like half as slow. Okay, so half half uh, so it's like like. Uh, uh, Twice as fast on, on Edison, for example, compared to uh, Cori and L. It's even worse for, for uh, Haswell. On the other hand, you have much wider vector units, and you have two of these, right? So before, if you had codes which do not use the vector units a lot, you had like maybe a factor four-ish difference, which in the end, basically not everything uh, vectorizes nicely usually, then it turns out to be factor two maybe. But here, if you do not vectorize well, it, you, can, you can lose a factor of 16 in performance. So it's like more than an order of magnitude, and you don't want that. Then another difference is, talked about this already, Edison, or like Ivy Bridge processor, has uh, 30 megabytes L3 cache, which help a lot in many applications, more than you maybe realize or not. Um, and uh, uh, the KNL doesn't, doesn't have that. So, and uh, you can think about, okay, we heard that before, like the, in, in, in uh, quad cache mode, for example, the, the DDR access cache, but this cache is only like 450 gigabytes per second fast, whereas an L3 uh, cache is about a terabyte per second or something. So that's a huge difference. And, um, and there are other caveats. On the other hand, you have this huge 16 gigabyte uh, of memory, which are like, uh, which, which, uh, we can pull data from is four times as fast as before. So you want to make use of this. So you think, okay, what can we do? Just recompile the code and go, right? So uh, you have, so uh, a KNL is x86-64 compatible, so you can just um, create your, uh, so recompile your code technically and just use it as, as you did before, or not even recompile it, just use it. Technically, you can do that. And also it's self-hosted, so no need for offloading and complicated pragmas for this. So you can just technically just run it. So what happens if you do that, at least, uh, so this plot shall illustrate this. These are uh, selected, these are codes from the, the NISA program. And this is the performance when you just take the original codes, compile them on, um, on, uh, on KNL and compare the performance on Edison, on Cori KNL versus Edison, these are the gray bars and then do the same for Corey Haswell, and you see something like this. And this doesn't look very well, so the median, median, not average speed up, is 15% with respect to Edison, if you just do this. And the median speed up versus Haswell is even, it's, even, it's, lower, it's slower than Haswell, because Haswell has, is a very strong processor. So what you, what you see here is that some of these, so this is a median speed up, right? Some of these uh, applications perform very, very badly on KNL. So like you get like 30% of what you got on Edison. And um, so this is what you, so this is like, like, like a cross-section about different applications. There are stencil applications, there are like, um, um, like uh, pick, uh, uh, particle and cell codes and, and, and all sorts of different applications. And this is like, uh, I, th I think so, if, uh, there's a high probability that if you have an application that it fits somewhere in this picture. So uh, what you also can see is that some applications benefit heavily. Those are mostly, uh, mostly applications which are bandwidth bound. So uh, I will talk about this later. So um, the thing is that you should optimize your code. Um, and why should you optimize your code? Okay, it's easy, right? You get more for your bucks, right? So you can, use, uh, you can make efficient use of Cori KNL. 
And I can uh, show you if you have like codes which are not really optimized at all, uh, there's a fast success possible because when you just look into these codes, there are lo lo lots of low hanging fruit you can just, uh, just pick and uh, you might get a good speed up already. On the other hand also, uh, it's not, it's not uh, completely pointless or worthless to, to optimize for KNL because uh, heterogeneous architectures are energy efficient and they will stay around. So probably future procurements, not only by our centers, but like in the, uh, in the, like looking at the HPC landscape nowadays, heterogeneous architectures are the future. So I can tell you, if you need to optimize your code, do it now, right? So this is a good time to start. And um, uh, it's not, as, it's not a, like a transition, like rough transition as we would have bought some GPU so that you have to learn CUDA and all these kind of things. Uh, it's more like a smooth transition, but uh, you should definitely uh, um, consider doing it. Uh, and the good thing is, even if you do not have access or you, you also use like uh, uh, um, many, uh, many courses, uh, multi-core systems, sorry, multi-core systems like uh, Edison or uh, uh, the Haswell partition of, uh, of Cori or like your university cluster, whatever, um, most of the optimizations um, which apply to KNL also give you a benefit on, on these architectures. So you will definitely get a benefit from most of it. Um, and not, not, on, on, or not only on KNL, that's the, that's the upside. The downside, of course, and that I'm totally aware of, the effort uh, for most, the most beneficial optimizations are really hard ones, so you have to restructure code, restructure data, stale, uh, uh, data structures uh, probably. And uh, some codes are really problematic because they are, they, are not they are not easy to make thread safe in any way uh, without major uh, changes in this part. So this can happen. Um, but don't be too afraid to just think about it. And uh, of course, this uh, investing in the future point is also downside. What if I bet on the wrong horse, right? <laughs> what is Intel says in, in two years, oh, we leave this HPC um, uh, um, segment uh, altogether. Uh, I can assure you there might be other vendors which will step in and which have similar approaches. So don't hesitate uh, like um, considering what I'm going to tell you. So, uh, <clears throat> when you optimize, um, you can do you have certain things to consider, like single node, multi node, maybe AO if you are uh, 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 AO heavy applications. And you, of course, should always start on single node performance. And why do you do that? Because it's um, there are a lot of reasons. So first, it's it's the easiest target, right? You can you can you have a, right a, a fast turnaround times for debugging, profiling, whatever, because you only need one node. And also, it's important because even if you have like a multi node case and you, uh, on multi-node application, you want to run it on large scale, you are bounded by the local, local execution speed, right? So uh, even if you can hide the communication perfectly uh, behind your computation, you will never be faster than a single node. So you should definitely look at the single node speed. And there are um, also many profiling tools for that available. So we discussed a couple of already. I will give like a more comprehensive list later. Um, when it comes to multi-node performance, there are a few optimization opportunities and the profiling is a bit tedious because you have to deal with all these different processes and uh, also the debugging is tricky. When you do these optimizations, you might find yourself in a debugging situation. That's, but we offer uh, tools for all that. Um, so you, you should not uh, hesitate trying, trying out things I will mention later. And for uh, I.O. Uh, performance, there are not many things you can do at the moment, but uh, a couple of, couple of suggestions I can offer. So, <clears throat> for the single node case, so what do I do? So I have an application and I want to know uh, what the problem is. Why, why is it, for example, 2x lower on KNL than Edison? So the first thing, very important, get to know your application, right? So uh, I don't know uh, <coughs> who's on the line. There might be like some uh, very specialized domain scientists, but in general, do not assume you already know your application because even like I talk to, uh, so even, so I come from a lattice QCD background, even there sometimes you, you ask, so what, what is actually the problem here? And then they tell you, oh, I don't know, this, 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 maybe this linear algebra routine, but actually when you really look at it, it's not the case. So it's important to determine hotspots, right? So um, uh, for example, you can do that by manual timing routines, right? You usually take subroutines or like loops or whatever you think takes a lot of time and time it. You can do that with manual timers. You have to be careful to use safe, uh, thread safety and, uh, uh, and put in synchronization barriers for MPI. But in general, uh, this is like a very simple approach and easily portable. 
You can also use uh, pro uh, profiling tools which do the job for you. And what one I like very much is CrayPad. It's like basically loading a module and uh, then uh, you just, the Cray, if you use the Cray weapons for compiling, they technically just annotate your code. And in the end, you will get, like, for all the major sections, you will get timing information, uh, additionally to some MPI, uh, I think, MPI uh, message, um, uh, MPI statistics. So if you go a um, little bit more involved, like things like advisor, because this guy can find time-consuming loops and analyzes them in the same step. And uh, uh, VTune, for example, which can do a lot of, lot of things, but it's very slow. So I, 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 for, for this task, I, I would suggest just trying, starting with CrayPad, just time, and see what's really, what really uh, uh, consumes a lot of time. And there's also something in between these here, which is Map, which, uh, which is very nice and comparably lightweight, because it does more like a sampling approach, and VTune is really heavyweight, and like a data collection of, of big, like big, uh, um, uh, big kernels can take a very long time. So this is also a nice uh, opportunity to try that out. So assume you timed your application, you found your hotspots. So what do you do? Um, especially, <coughs> what features shall I target, right? So you have, a, you have an application, a, a, a hotspot, which takes like 90% of the time in your application. And then, yeah, so huh, shall I use many threads or try to vectorize that thing or try to go for the more complex intrinsics in the application? Or like, do I just move to MCDRAM or use the MCDRAM more efficiently? Uh, so what shall I do from that? And the, the answer is understand these hotspots now, okay? So you found them, understand them. And then for each of these cases you can end up with, uh, you have like certain options. For example, if you are compute bound, what that means I will tell you later, then you throw all threads at it you can, you uh, vectorize as much as you can, and you use the ISA, so the co uh, complex intrinsics. Um, when you're memory bandwidth bound, you have to exploit the memory tier hierarchy more, and you definitely um, also want to throw threads at it, because more threads can, uh, can saturate the bandwidth better. Right? So a single thread usually cannot uh, saturate the bandwidth fully. <clears throat> and if you are latency bound, which is like a, like a more complicated thing, then usually what, what can help, for example, more threads and vectorization. So I, I, I will Question. take what, yes. Every option there includes more threads. Is there ever a time when you'd want to use less threads? So I mean like uh, more, more you, sh you tr no, you, should, you, sh you do not want less threads. You will technically always try more processes or more threads. That's like my, my take on it. So try to, so this is one, one suggestion I will have. I will show that exploit all, like, uh, like try to f identify and exploit all the parallelism you can find, right? Because you have a lot of it and you want to make use of it. <clears throat> so less threads in the sense that it might not make sense to utilize all the hyper threads. So that, that's true. So, but the hardware likes like one thread per core, like for example, on at least 64 cores, you, 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 you try to want to utilize that. You don't want to leave half the ship idle. Um, so yeah, hyper is a different story because they share like uh, execution units and things. So that's, that's a more tricky question. But for example, if you are compute bound, then you can try that. You can try using them. So, um, so what, what do you need to understand these things if you're memory bound, bandwidth bound, whatever, uh, bandwidth bound, uh, compute bound or whatsoever? So first you need to compile and run. We said that already. Um, so you, uh, for Cray wrappers, you can technically just load the, the, you can swap the Haskell model to the mic model and then just compile and everything will be fine. For Intel, um, you can, so you can do the same, but you can also do manually by adding this uh, optimization that it optimizes to the AVX 512 architectures. And for GNU, you just pass minus M arch KNL. And use pro a proper OpenMP settings. So this is just an example. Helen talked more, uh, in more detail about it a minute ago. Um, so make sure that your binding is somehow sane, right? So if, of course, you can get very bad performance if you pin all your threads to a single core or like a couple of cores, right? That can really impact the performance. So before you, you uh, open, for example, support ticket, uh, make sure that your, MP, that your uh, OMMP and your MPI binding is somewhat sane, right? In order to get a sane binding, again, I repeat, use the job script generator um, or like uh, uh, our like documentation uh, user help on the website. And as a node configuration for everybody who's not like very experimental friendly, just try KNL Quad Cache and you should be fine for many, many applications. <coughs> and you don't have to worry about MCDRAM usage for the moment because it will be done in the background for you. So what else do you need? You need to understand the number of flops. So the number of floating point operations you execute 
It's not per second. It's the number, like the total number of, of floating point operations. So you go to a kernel and count these things. So you can either do that manually, which is a bit tedious, but it's nice to understand somehow the, the, uh, the order of magnitude, right? So for each float and uh, addition multiplication, you count plus one. And for each complex multiplication, you have six because you have four multiplications and two additions, okay? And then for loops, you multiply with the trip counts and so on. So that, that you can do, and then you get an approximate flop count for this kernel. Uh, you can also measure it with the software development emulator toolkit by Intel, which works like this. So you have, for example, here an expensive loop, and then you, you insert like an, a so-called mark, an SSC mark, uh, before and after. And then you run this, you load the SDE module, and then run this with a, uh, and prepend this SDE 64. There's also an SDE without the 64, but, but that only, that overflows, uh, I think that only uses 32-bit counters or something. So I highly recommend using this. <laughs> and uh, with some, some very uh, uh, cryptic magic uh, commands, uh, um, so we, we have this uh, documentation on the website how to do that, but just, just technically just copy this. And um, we have this uh, start and stop regions, which basically say that start the flop collection when the, when the code execution passes this point uh, and stop it here, right? And then you will technically just get the flops produced in that kernel. And it also accounts for masking. For example, uh, KNL supports like vector masking and things like that, and it will account for these things. So you will get a relatively precise flop count from that. And it's pretty, like, it's a no-brainer. It's just that the runtime of this thing can be very large if you, uh, if you profile a long section. So you should technically try to, try to downscale the section and then uh, try to uh, estimate for bigger problems or for more realistic problems what this flop count will be. The next thing you need is bytes. So the number of bytes transferred from main memory, okay, for this kernel. Um, so from main memory, not from cache, okay. So you can, you can compute this manually. Technically you cannot, so and we don't recommend it because um, you do not account for data reuse for caching, right? So only, uh, so what can, so, and, and on the opposite for, for uh, uh, by, uh, so what can happen, for example, if you estimate your byte usage by hand and say, okay, uh, and you, you assume that everything I need is only read once and written once, for example, that is usually a bad approximation because you can have, um, uh, you can have cache evictions and all these kind of things and uh, you have to read the data multiple times from main memory. So it's good to have like an order of magnitude uh, estimate here, but definitely I um, recommend measured with VTune. Um, so, for example, there is, um, there is this, uh, you, you can an uh, annotate your code. Uh, so this is a C example, there's also Fortran equivalent for that. Uh, we include basically the ITT notify library, and then before your kernel, you, you insert like this ITT resume, and then after that an ITT pour stem. It's the same idea as with SDE. You can even do that in, uh, in one go, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would uh, separate this. And then you run it with VTune and collect the memory access. And that precisely obtains counter events like uh, the memory counter events. So really know what kind of data was transferred in that section. So once you have this, you do the following. So you model your performance using the roofline performance model. And that says the following. First, you compute the arithmetic intensity, which is just the ratio of uh, flops by bytes. Okay. And then you compute the performance of your kernels, which is just the number of flops di di uh, divided by the execution time. So this, 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 the time you got in the first, first run when you, when you, uh, when you, pro when you uh, looked at the timings for all your kernels, right? So you have that number. And then you plot this on the architectural roof line, okay? And the, the architectural roof line is given by the minimum of the memory bandwidth from main memory uh, times your, uh, um, um, arithmetic intensity and the peak flops, right? So how does that look like? So this is a picture. This is for, for KNL. So you have, so this is basically the, the roof line for DDR, right? This is the roof line for, uh, for high bandwidth memory or MCD RAM. And this is, for example, the peak flops you can reach when you do not vectorize your code. And this is like the maximum peak flops you can, you can get, okay? So, and what will happen when you compute this, uh, this arithmetic intensity and the performance for one of your kernels, you will end up, for example, um, here, okay? And this, for example, tells you that your kernel has a very low AI and you hang at this roof line, you are memory bandwidth bound. 
And uh, probably you ran the code out of DDR because you hang at the DDR roof line. So in that case, what you want to do, you want to use MCDRAM to make your code faster, right? So load, this is a logarithmic scale, right? So this, this for example, helps here. <coughs> what you also can find is that you have a kernel which hangs around here, right? At the vectorization roof line. So that means this here, it really helps to uh, try to vectorize your code properly so that you can break through that and get a better performance. So when you do that, probably you, you end up at the instruction level parallelism roof line. So this is, uh, a, uh, this is, so, uh, this is when your code do does not use uh, fuse multiply, ad multiply adds. So for example, ma matrix multiplications, you have a lot of fuse, you can uh, make heavy use of this fuse multiply adds, also in Fourier transforms, but not every kernel can. So that's, uh, that is, uh, and only if you ex uh, exploit these, you get another factor of two or something to get to the peak, peak roof line. And then there's something in between, and that's unfortunately many kernels are like this. <laughs> you are somehow not really memory, not really compute bound, not really memory bandwidth bound, maybe latency bound, something like this. So what you can try is uh, improve your threading and the vectorization, and you might move up a little bit. But don't expect too much here. This is really like a tri tricky problem. You really have to uh, have to uh, an, a in uh, in depth investigation as to follow what, what is really going on. So okay, assume you did all that. But then you think, okay, so wait, um, are you happy with this guy here? Probably not, right? Because uh, it, it's, it's, it's at the roof line, so you cannot do better by, by, by simple changes, but you're, you're still your performance might be, might be rather bad. So the only way to improve that thing is now to improve the arithmetic intensity, right? Because if you move in this direction, you have still like room left, okay? So for these things, you need to really look harder and work harder. So what can you do? Um, so repeat it, the uh, arithmetic intensity is flops over bytes. To improve it, meaning to increase it, means you can, for example, improve the, uh, so increase the number of flops and uh, leave the number of bytes the same. That sounds easy, but it's, <laughs> it's actually not, because uh, the flops are, det like your algorithm determines the flops, like the problem you tackle and the algorithm determines the flops. So it's not easy to change the number of flops uh, of course, you can put in like meaningless flops, multiplication with ones or adding zeros, but this is not the point here, right? We want to um, increase, uh, improve the execution speed. So uh, this is usually not a viable way. What you though can do is you can try to keep the number of flops constant, but try to uh, reduce the number of bytes read from main memory. And in reality, you always a trade-off between these these kind of things. Uh, but it's it's so this is the so the second point is the is is the way to go. Okay. So this is more in detail, what you could do. First, you have a lot of cores. You have a lot of threads, you have vectorization. Um, try to reduce, and, and for example, if you use OpenMP, try to reduce overhead, okay? So what I've seen a couple of times uh, is like uh, code, which I've written like in a linear algebra sense. So maybe this is a very, very stupid version of this, I would say, sorry, no offense. Um, but this is like, um, um, uh, you multiply a vector with a matrix, store the vector, then you, 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 you uh, subtract the vector from another vector, and then you compute the norm of it. This is more like how you think about it in mathematics, but this is not how you should write it, right? You should technically fuse these loops to one big one, so that you have a lot of work in here, and also um, you do not create like a, a fork and merge OpenMP sections all the time, right? Because when you profile this thing, it will tell you that you have a lot of OpenMP synchronization barriers which you don't want to have and you don't need. And when you have a, a nested loop, like the one below, this is like a typical uh, loop you have in physical, like in physics problems, whatever, um, like this uh, loop over like three dimensions, for example. In, uh, in, uh, if you use OpenMP, there is a nice co uh, statement called collapse, which basically just flattens out the whole loop and, dis and throws the, uh, the threads, uh, like distributes them over the whole fused, uh, uh, collapsed loop, okay? So that is, that is quite good, because if you do not put this in, then it would only throw the threads uh, at, 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 at the outermost loop, right? So that is uh, something you should, you should think about. And uh, another thing is, you need to rearrange data structures probably, so you can try to move the OpenMP out, so going from a fine-grained uh, parallelization model like this one to a more coarse-grained parallelization model. That is not always easy to do and requires a lot of maybe um, uh, like, for example, uh, storing intermediate results in arrays and things like that. But there is like a, a certain trade-off and, and usually you can gain 
a lot if, if, if you do that to a certain extent. I think we have also some case studies on the web pages which, which describe this. So the next thing uh, is loop tiling. So loop tiling improves cache reuse and uh, therefore reduces potentially the number of bytes uh, read from main memory because they are not from read from main memory but from cache. Okay, And cache has a much, much higher bandwidth so you don't, do not really care about that. So this, for example, is, is, a, is a very, very simplified kernel of, uh, from, a, from the quantum espresso material science code. It's technically, we have a matrix and multiply um, uh, the rows of the matrix with this B vector and store it in another matrix. So the problem here is that IR, or like NIR is long. So this is a very long loop and this is also a very long loop. And what will happen is when you go through the I IRs, it will basically, uh, you see that that B is not dependent on J, what will happen is that it basically streams through the A and Bs and then starts again for the next J iteration. But then, let's for example, the, the, the Bs earlier in the loop, in the previous loop, are already evicted from cache and you need to load them again. So the trick is here, and this is always a good thing to do, is like block or like tie loops. So it makes the code a bit more complicated, but it can significantly, really significantly improve performance. So what we did here was, we defined a block size, so this might be architecture dependent or you might use a block size which works well on like the, the architectures you're targeting. Do some uh, uh, index calculations, so don't worry about it, but the idea is you basically have now an uh, uh, iteration over, over chunks of the inner loop, okay? So this is like, this is iter iterates over blocks and here you iterate over a given block, okay? And by that you can keep this BIR in memory for all the Js for example. So this, um, this is very important uh, and especially because uh, on KNL we don't have the, uh, the L3 cache, right? So these kind of codes, so like the, the first loop I showed you, usually uh, the big L3 cache helped you because if you couldn't, couldn't find the data in L2, you went to L3 and found it there probably, but on KNL you don't have it. So every L2 miss goes to DDR or like MCD RAM, right? You go to main memory and you don't want that. And when you try to, to, to block these kind of things, you can try to block to shared L2. So an L2 is shared between uh, two cores in a tile, right? And the shared means like the, the, the fraction of a core of it. It's like around 500 kilobytes, okay? So if you try to block your loop content to this 500 kilobytes, you usually get a good L2 hit rate. And in order to see if these kind of transformations are successful or even tuning them, you can, you can use VTune to check, for example, L1 and L2 miss rates, right? You can just look and see how big the miss rates are and then adjust the block size, for example, accordingly. Then the other thing you can try is short loop unrolling. And this is basically just helping the, the compiler to vectorize what you want him to vectorize. For example, you have this uh, nicely collapsed loop with a collapse free statement. And then in here you have some norm calculation over like a, f like a free vector. So if you leave it like this, what can happen is that the compiler sees, okay, nice, this thing is collapsed. Oh, wait, there's another loop here. Let's vectorize it. So the outer vectorizer might try to vectorize that thing. But that is, has a trip count of three. So you waste a lot of vector lanes. You don't want to vectorize here. You want to vectorize here, right? Because usually these, these indices might be big. And if you don't put the SIMD statement here, the compiler will probably take this loop to, uh, for vectorization as a target. And um, that is not great. So what you need to do is to unroll this loop. Um, and this is only a trip count of three, right? So not, not a big deal, you just, just unroll it and then you're done. Especially with this, this loops with uh, like, uh, like trip counts which are not an integer multiple of two or four or something, they are really like the compiler does, sometimes does partial unrolling and tiling and, and these kind of things and usually spends a lot of, or in, uh, a lot of cycles on, 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 on like uh, stitching the, the, these loops back together. So in the end what you will, you will find is that uh, you have a lot of, lot of overhead due to that. <coughs> So uh, you can also, if you do not want to do manual unrolling, you can do unrolling pragmas. They are usually not portable, so I think the Intel has a different ones from, G, uh, from GNU. But in, uh, technically you can just, just put in like a pragma unroll and jam, or like directive unroll and jam, and then it will do that for you. Also, check the compiler optimization reports when you do that. Sometimes it's especially like the bottom, the very bottom, because when it goes through the, through the, through the code, um, and uh, compiles it, it says, yeah, this loop has been vectorized, this loop has been vectorized, vectorized. In the end it says, oh wait, I did not vectorize these loops because they are, it's like probably inefficient, something like that. So definitely check the compiler output if it vectorizes the loops uh, you want them to vectorize. 
or use Intel Advisor, it basically just, it's a very fancy way of parsing these, these uh, optimization reports and presenting like suggestions to the user how to properly vectorize certain things. Or use, for example, Cray Reveal, um, which I think there's a, there's a presentation about this later on, right? So uh, there, there are a lot of tools which help you, uh, help you here. So one thing about vectorization is data alignment. Um, you should align and pet data. Fortunately in Fortran, for example, GFortran does it automatically for you. Uh, if you use the Intel compiler, you have to tell him to do it. So uh, if you compile your code in Fortran, try to put in a line array 64 byte so that all the arrays are nicely aligned. In C and C++, uh, it's not so easy, unfortunately. Um, so what you have there is like this aligned alloc, or in, I think this is GNU, attribute aligned, and then for Intel, you have this decal spec aligned 64. This, this goes directly to the, either the malloc statements or the new. Um, and then in C++, you can play the trick, just overload the new operator with this aligned allocs, and you're done, right? <clears throat> so that's usually, uh, 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 but in C, you don't have this option. So that's, uh, you can write a function, like overload, you can write a function and use this, but you technically have to go through the code. Um, yeah, data padding. Uh, I don't want to talk about this, more like an advanced thing. So if you have really like, a, if you really want to go to the peak flops, you might need to uh, pad certain arrays because of cache acidity conflicts. I don't want to talk about this in more detail, but uh, um, I think um, those who, who uh, uh, I think this is more like an, an expert technique. Okay. So another thing is um, make use of the uh, new intrinsic set. Uh, and especially help the compiler to generate those, okay? So this is a loop, or this is a, a kernel. Um, actually, I didn't found it that way. I found it already in the, in the tweaked version, but this is a kernel you could technically find in, in, the, in the wild. So this is like an, um, a smoothing kernel from a multigrid code, and it's even odd preconditioned. So what it does, it, it uh, 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 iterates over the even sides and then over the odd sides. And um, this is an inefficient version. So we have a SIMD statement here, and inside this, this vectorized loop, we have an if condition. So the, the, so the, the uh, can L can mask out, so it can detect this, this, uh, this condition, these conditionals, and mask out the flops. But what will happen is that since you iterate over every I, it basically half of your vector lanes will produce something, results which you don't use, right? And when you um, compile this application with this kernel, and this kernel is like 90% of the runtime, you get like a 1.2 seconds of uh, runtime. But when you do the following, when you remove this if condition, and instead put it on top and compute an offset and iterate over two, right? It looks like a very, very stupid and easy transformation, but this is vectorized nicely because now the, the compiler can generate like gather intrinsic. So basically it can, it can take like only the even elements, and then gather them, pack them together in a, in a, to, fill the, to fill the vector unit, execute this, and then um, basically um, emit it and inject it back. And this is, um, this is much more efficient, for example, in this case, uh, the app runs in 0.8 seconds. So we get a 1.5 speed up just by this tiny, tiny thing. So watch out for these kind of things when you, when you, when you, when you vectorize, and really try to play around to, sh to shuffle this conditional. So first get, try to get rid of them uh, uh, completely, but if you can, try to do these kind of transformations to basically reduce those. There's also one thing which is called reduced precision math. So like if you have a lot of transcendental functions or square roots, exponentials, whatever, they are expensive. And uh, the CANEL, the ISA, has a, a, a so-called uh, reduced precision uh, variance of that, and you can enable them by specifying floating point model fast equals two, uh, in the Intel compiler with no precise uh, uh, diffs uh, during compilation. And um, this can help you. So don't expect too much from it, uh, but it, it, if you are like, very heavily using these kind of things, it might really help you. Um, also what we found is a funny, funny thing. If you have like something like this, you, you divide by a constant in a loop, don't do that, just define the inverse of it and multiply with it. This is, it's funny that the compiler does not necessarily pick that up, right? Especially if you have like a, like a bigger code. So this, this sometimes gives you like 10% for free, something like this. So this is really like weird. Um, uh, of course, um, reduced precision for these kind of things might not always be acceptable. Uh, so you have to decide what you want. So reduced precision means somewhere in between double and single precision. <coughs> 
Okay, so what are the benefits of this uh, of the AVX512 instruction set? So this is what we found in the NISAP codes. So this displays the speed up when you compile the code with AVX512 versus compiling the code with AVX2 for the optimized codes. So they already nicely vectorize. And so the median speed up we get is about 1.2, so like 20%. Okay? But there you can the benefits can be much larger, for example, here, right? Uh, and that can have um, multiple, um, uh, so you would expect naively factor of two because the vector lanes are twice as wide, but uh, usually uh, uh, it's not the case, right? But um, it can be larger because of more efficient memory operations because AVX512 has this nice uh, vector loads and store operations um, like uh, scatter, gather, broadcast, these kind of things. And, some are, and, and most of them are not available in AVX2. And those help you, for example, or help the prefetching uh, engine, like the prefetcher in the CPU, to work more efficiently. So even you can technically reduce memory latency by using that. Um, of course, uh, AVX512 is automatically enabled when compiling for KNL, so you don't have to do anything. So here we had to manually disable it in order to test it. Um, use MCD RAMs, we, uh, we talked about this already. Um, I can recommend just always use it. <laughs> don't, 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 uh, don't, don't think about not using it. So this is the, uh, also the cross-section over the NISAP codes. This is the speed app we get. So the gray bars are the MCD RAM. The speed app you get when you run your code from fully from MCD or like from MCD RAM versus running it from DDR. And the red gives you the, so which is like, so the, sorry, the gray might be either a flat or cache, whatever the best configuration was for that code. And then we compare additionally what is the, the benefit of going to flat instead of, of cache mode? So what you see is that MCD RAM always helps, right? There is no case where it really hurts you. So this is like, uh, it's like, uh, like there's no uh, good speed up, but technically it won't, it won't hurt you. So always use it. Flat versus cache is a bit more mixed back because um, um, if you want to use flat, you either have to do this manual placing the arrays where you want them, but then you have to also think about which arrays to place. I cannot recommend using this numeracy TL minus preferred, because what will usually happen if you spill out, that usually, usually many codes, like at the beginning, you initialize a lot of different arrays for uh, maybe setting up the whole thing, and, uh, the, but the really hot arrays you work with come usually later on. So it, it might, there might be a good probability that those will be allocated into, into um, into DDR and that you don't want. So in my opinion, in these cases, use, can, use, use just the cache mode, or if you fit into, if you fit into 16 gigabytes, use numectl m <laughs> uh, and then it will error out if, if, you, if, you, if you run out of memory. So as, as, at least you know what, what happens. Um, and this is why mostly I think these kind of lengths, the flat performance is worse because they use numectl p they didn't worry about uh, uh, putting the arrays like, uh, uh, like according to how, how they need it and uh, distribute them uh, between uh, MCD RAM and, and uh, DDR. They just use this minus P option. This is why they perform so badly. So uh, then in that, in that case, just use cache. There's one note on heap allocation. Uh, can our memory cache is comparably slow? Um, it's not super bad if you have like a normal code, but some codes have like kernels where they allocate a lot of lot of arrays and deallocate them. And that's very bad practice. So if you have something like an iterative solver and you in, in, that pro, in, in, in every iteration step you do a lot of memory allocations, don't do that. Move them out. Okay? So just move them out as far as possible so that you allocate technically just your whole stuff once. Um, if this is too involved, if you have a huge code framework, you can try, you can think about pool allocator libraries. So what they technically do, for example, Intel TBB, uh, they overload new malloc or whatever, and and basically instead of really allocating memory, so ask, asking operating system for memory, what they do will they will ask the allocator to hand out memory which was pre-allocated, right? So that's much much faster. And the good thing is you do not need to change the code, except for linking properly. The bad thing is that the, um, you need to know the memory footprint because you as, you uh, allocate a pool, and if you run over, mostly it will just crash with out of memory, and the code is less portable. <laughs> Right, so that's that's the drawback. So the best thing is just don't do a lot of allocations. That's my <laughs> my hint. For multi-node, um, yeah. So there are, not, as I said, not not super many things you can do. But one important thing to consider is that a single KNL thread cannot saturate the arise injection rate. So you get you do not get the full bandwidth. 
So this is a plot from the uh, uh, so multi-rank uh, ba uh, bandwidth. I think it's just the ping pong thing. So like you have two nodes sending messages to each other. And uh, this is for one rank per node, two ranks per node, four ranks per node, and so on. And this is the, the bandwidth you measure depending on the size of the messages. And what you can see is that, so this is, so this, this, this CUSP is technically a, a, a protocol change. But what you can see is that you, f you flat out, right? But also like one rank is pretty, pretty bad in terms of bandwidth. So what you want to do is you want to run more than one MPI rank per node if you have this kind of pattern. Because it can get you a lot of, lot of benefit in this region especially. <coughs> Of course, we want to uh, we want to like um, encourage users to have this mi uh, 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 mixed model between OpenMP and MPI, and this looks like we encourage users to do the opposite because with 64 ranks per node, you only get the maximum bandwidth for large messages. But in that case, you can, for example, think about using uh, um, threaded communication in MPI, and I think with MPI4, there are even more. Uh, uh, this threaded communication will be even better and that, that would be definitely a good opportunity to, to really, really uh, saturate the, the memory bandwidth. This is, I think, mostly because the cores are so weak, a single core is so weak, that, uh, that you need a lot of them to basically get, uh, pull everything efficiently. So I re can recommend more than four ranks per node, or like let's say four ranks, eight ranks, 16 ranks per node probably. And uh, as Helen said, that dedicate cores to the operating system. So. If you, for example, use four ranks per node or eight, you cannot like divide this 68 cores nicely so that you end up with like, um, like if, that you do not split tiles. So that means you can just assume that you have 64 cores and dedicate, for example, two cores to the operating system, right? And that's usually a good choice because then you have also some error mitigation, like noise mitigation. So huge pages, uh, we said it again. So huge pages, what they technically do, I think, they reduce uh, uh, transaction lookaside buffer misses in the arrays when it translates uh, addresses. And um, how to use it? So you, you basically load one of the huge pages module at compile time, just one. So it doesn't matter which one, right? You, you just need to have one loaded. And at runtime, you load the huge page module size you want, right? So you can load, you can, uh, at compile time, you can load the two megabyte one and runtime you can use any other. So for example, that's, that's nice. And um, there's also um, some, some MPI, uh, uh, um, uh, MPH environment variables you can try out. For example, if you have codes which are very collective heavy, um, non-blocking or blocking, doesn't matter, try to use dmap. So add LD map, so that's for, for static linking, uh, for dynamic linking. For static linking, it's a bit more, more, more elaborate, but I can give, give out the string. Um, and then try to export these variables here. What they technically do is they uh, activate remote memory access over this DMAP library. And then you, they tell DMAP to basically uh, to, to grab the collectives from MPI and use the DMAP library to execute them, which then use RMA to be executed. And this is also, um, for certain collective operations, I think that they are somehow done in the network buffer. So these kind of things, when you set them, that might, in certain cases, give you like up to 20% speed ups. At least this is what I have seen. Um, if you do this MPI free, uh, single sided um, uh, remote memory atomics, for example, you can also try to set this guy. Uh, this is especially cool for um, small messages. So if you have like an accumulate, get accumulate, or whatever operation, then uh, for an integer or a single float or double or something, you can set this and what it will do, I think it will use the hardware to, 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 uh, uh, to do this, to do the locking. So this, is, this can give you up to a, a 20x speed up, but only for small messages. So if it's like, so late, the latency might, might be 20x better. So if you have bigger messages, that might actually hurt you. Okay, so last thing is no, some notes on IO. <clears throat> So this is the right bandwidth in megabytes per second uh, on Haskell and KNL. So please ignore the sync and direct I.O. So this is for the buffered I.O. And what you see is like uh, KNL is 2x slower for single core. Okay. So that, is, that doesn't sound great for people who do a lot of I.O. But there is a solution. And uh, as everything on KNL, just go to multi-core. Okay. So this is the bandwidth you will get with... Uh, nodes and different cores per node, right? So this is the bandwidth on, on uh, this is the, uh, I think one is write, one is read. I think this is read, this is write. <laughs> um, if I recall correctly, it doesn't say it actually. Ah, it read, read and write, yes. <clears throat> so, and 
what it tells you, you see that at, at a single at a single core, KNL uh, looks very bad. But if you go to multiple cores, you can even outperform Haswell easily. And um, I mean, I don't recommend like going like to uh, 64 uh, 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 64 way uh, frets. But technically, if you just use like eight or 16, you're always better off. Okay? There's one problem, and I talked to our I/O people like Jian Lin and uh, and Glenn. There are no good threaded I/O solutions available. So um, either you implement your own, or you uh, I think I don't know if this is uh, if there are some issues with POSIX, or you use uh, for example um, multiple processes, and then you can use for example MPI I/O right to do the I/O. So do not do not do the following. This, if you want to write out data, gather everything on node zero and write it out. Don't do that on rank zero and write it out. Don't do that, please. Just try to use MPIO or, for example, HD5, which uses MPIO under the hood for parallel I/O. Right. So that's a, that's the take-home message here. Try to parallelize your I/O if you are really having uh, to write a lot of data. And then, which is always a good good um, thing to do, especially for Lustre. Write big chunks, so pool your I/O. Don't don't write small chunks once in a while. Like try to pool it and then write a big chunk, because every time you write small data, you might ping the the Lustre metadata service, which really slows you down. And uh, reduce the file operations, so the open and the closes. So don't don't like open and close files all the time, right? Try to try to reduce this, and of course try to reduce the whole uh, uh, like the whole file, uh, the whole number of files you want to write. For large files, uh, so it's hard to tell when it will help you, but for large files like order 10 gigabytes and higher, try the burst buffer. <laughs> so this is a completely different world. There might be a different tutorial, and as Helen said, that you should try it out. We have, uh, so I linked the page. So if you click on this, this, this text, it will, uh, you will, it will, it will bring you to the burst buffer page, and you can just try it out. It might help you. It's a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised with the I.O. result for the release. And I see the slide. Yeah. So I would expect like much more difference in the read rate. For I mean, I expect much slower KNL. You know. In in what? In it's like this. The scale is different. It's thousand is two thousand, right? Wait, wait, wait. No, I'm looking at the left side. Yeah. So those are read rate between comparison between KNL and Haswell, right? Yes. So this is KNL. This Haswell. Yeah. They are. Very close. I think that's a bit of a surprise. It, it looks close, but I think it's actually not that close. It's like um, the I scale is... That is much more like uh, normal to me, but it's... This one's here. Yeah, I don't know. This, I, I got the data from, from Gian. I believe that somehow. <laughs> and I think Brian checked it and he said that that looks okay. So, coming back. So I talked about all these optimizations and now you think, okay, does this stuff help? And for, uh, we applied these optimizations to this code. So this is like the, the before the optimization, right? So we applied like selections of these optimizations to these codes, right? And maybe a little bit more. So uh, more info about this you can find on the case studies. I will post the link later. Um, so this is how it looked like with a median speed of 15% on Edison and uh, uh, on Haswell you were slower. And now after that process, we get a median speed up, and that is now the optimized code on has on sorry on KNL versus the optimized code on Edison. So uh, you get a 1.8x speed up now, and uh, on on uh, median and on Haswell it's about it's about even. Okay, but please note that these optimizations also in in almost all cases sped up the the performance on Edison Haswell as well. So that's that's important. So it does not. It, it doesn't show that, of course, right? But uh, uh, you benefit for, for all the architectures we can offer. OK, so that's the summary. Um, so when you optimize code, go, to single, go, to, go for single node performance first. And then try definitely try loop fusion and tiling. That helps a lot. Ensure good vectorization and uh, use MCDRAM all the time. And multi-node performance, please try out huge pages. Very simple, right? Just load a module and <coughs> compile. Uh, and try this DMAP stuff, uh, which is also like setting a couple of environment variables, and that's it. And uh, for IO performance, I talked a little bit about it. Like, try to use parallel IO, pool it, and of course, reduce file operations to minimum. 
so we have a lot of training material. Yeah, for so this is like all of them are hyperlinks for running jobs, how to do the thread binding, for code profiling and tools. We have a lot of tools to offer. Uh, how to measure the arithmetic intensity? We have a set of scripts which basically grabs the output of VTune and 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 SDE and just gives you the numbers you're interested in, so that you don't need to go go through the GUI and and, and look for that. And um, how you can improve uh, OpenMP scaling, vectorization, MCD RAM, and also very important, please look at the case studies. So you might have a code which is very similar to a code we already optimized, uh, especially if you have something like stencil-based stuff. Uh, definitely look into the case studies and maybe into literature. There might be, there, there's a lot of lot of different uh, things around which can really help you to optimize that. Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs>